very in tune with what's going on over there. How's everybody doing? Yeah. Oh, that was me. <laughs> I know we're a small group, but let's try this again. How are we doing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll take that. Uh, well, thank you for coming out to the Newtown Art Gallery, and thank you, Newtown Art Gallery, for hosting this event. We really appreciate it. Uh, this is uh, our second in our uh, Plays in Progress series with Panglossian Productions. Uh, first was done last month at Aromas. Some of you might have been there in Newport News. Uh, we're glad to be here tonight uh, for The King's Face by Stephen Young. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Panglossian does have a regular season as well. Uh, coming up in June is K2, uh, followed by Scream Queens in July, and then uh, The Woman in Black October. in October. Of course, you're sitting right in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> Details, nothing more. The particulars should not concern you. They are my particulars, are they not? Why they will, they will only serve to upset you. Well, obviously that effect has been achieved. A full report will be made to His Majesty. His Majesty is not present to receive it. It is in your best interest. What is in my best interest is that you no longer counterfeit the truth. The angle is quite severe, and the wound is deep. Tell me something beyond the obvious. No one believes the arrowhead can be achieved. <laughs> I hope my report meets with your satisfaction. That is all? That is all. What do you think you're doing? Going to your father. I did not give you leave. My apologies, I meant no disrespect. May I continue? Oh, damn you to hell! I beg your pardon. Forgive me. Please forgive me. Dominatis, give me nobis, Pedro Nostra, Salva Nostra, Vigne, Imperiori, Virtu, and Cairo Monis. I shall take my leave. Silence! Virtu, and Cairo Monis, and Vas, Caseriton, Ayes, Quae, Caseriton, and I. May I go? Did prison teach you to be insubordinate, or are you born to it? Your Highness, forgive me, but you are mortal, and like all mortal men, there are limits. I am not like other mortal men. Perhaps not. I am amazed that in your present condition you were able to remain upright, orate at great lengths, and argue with such vehemence. It is the inability of those around me to remedy my present condition that inspires such vehemence. If you will pardon me, I take my leave. I do not appreciate how you and others of your trade can be so dismissive. I fail to understand. For days, I am told nothing. I'm prodded like a fattened calf, left ignorant of my situation, and like a fattened calf, since the ax is to fall, but have no certainty when. It is nothing short of cruel. It is customary practice. I assure you, customary. Not to speak of my condition in my presence, as if I were deaf, daft, or, or dead, to treat a prince in the way reserved for the feeble and the aged, unless I force it from you? You need to sleep. Do I really need the practice since the eternal one is staring me in the face? Do not look at me that way. What would your highness have me do? Change the nature of your gaze. Now! I do not follow. When you talk to me, talk to me. When you look at me, see me. I see you perfectly. That's not what I meant. Forgive me. There is an army of men dedicated to the curative arts that can do nothing to remedy my situation. And you, like all of them, preen your expertise by predicting the date of my demise. 
as if the certainty of death merits the respect of saving life. Do you know how that feels? Something akin, I should think, to Christ watching Roman soldiers cast dice at his feet. Your Highness, the men assembled on your behalf are at a loss. Are you too at a loss, Bradmore? Or when you look at me, do you see a dead man? Do not deny it. Your eyes show the truth your lips profess to hide. Your Highness, I am but a man. I cannot promise to save you. I thought the truth would only add to your suffering. I need you to champion my life. I am sad to say that Think in other ways, Bradmore. In battle, if the, if the wall cannot be breached, you go under, around, or through. You must do the same. Your father wishes to use conventional protocols and procedures. I have my instructions. To hell with him! Forgive me, but all he cares about is designing the outcome of my being, and now that it is slipping away, he is curiously absent. Sending you reflects the final charge of desperate men having less to do with my restoration than more with the question, when may we hang the funeral trappings for poor Harry? Wake up, Bradmore. You are here to declare an end, not announce a resurrection. And I will not endure it. If your father should visit, I will never enter this chamber. You're a servant. Death is too near, and his soul too tortured. Very well. I shall be your advocate. Good man. I'm sure it will lighten your subjects' hearts to hear of your brave struggle. <laughs> you exhaust me. Lighten hearts. <laughs> what world is it you live in, Bradmore? Behind those cold stairs is right malevolence, black with judgment and desire. They hate me. They respect you. They fear me, or they fear the king. Or they fear the king I might become. Moments like these are a reminder I am but flesh and blood. Kings who appear mortal inspire men with thoughts of immortality. The realm watched my father snatch the crown and decree himself king. So simple, they whisper in the dark places of their hearts. Bolingbroke did it, so could I. It happened only four years ago, but memories of Plantagenet's sedition are alive and well, spawning as many treasons as there are blades of grass in the English countryside. The Battle of Shrewsbury laid it to rest. It will never rest. I heard a monk tell another the arrow that struck me is a penance, and my face a permanent reflection of the anger of God. The monk no longer resides with us. Forgive me, Your Highness. I should not be privy to such a confidence. I wish to be excused. Is this your polite way of telling me I talk too much? Resting body and mouth is advised. Silence it is, then. It's not what I... I'm confused. Confused or afraid? Both. I promise you, you will not be held responsible for the loss of a man already declared dead. It's more than that. Like the money? The fear of returning to prison? May I speak? Do so, and plainly. Passing judgment on a monk is beyond me. I am only a surgeon, not an advisor. I need you to be more than that. My dear counterfeiter, Sergio. It is not my place. It is if I say it is. You cannot will it to be so. Come, let it ring through the hills. I have discovered the one man in England who wants nothing of me. Here before me stands the one Englishman that can be trusted. That is an expectation of which I am not worthy. I determine your worthiness. I do not wish to raise your ire. Do you not understand? Understand God's anger? Treason? What? This is beyond my scope and comfort. Friendship is beyond you? Friendship? Am I to be forced to say it? Please. I need a friend. No more subjects, counselors, or clergy. The one thing I do not have is a friend, and I want one. One I can trust, and when I look in the eyes of that friend, I want to see hope and a belief that I might live. This I need. Your Highness, I understand, but if I am to have any hope of serving you, you must trust I have your welfare at the forefront. I beg you, do not mock my profession. If I seem aloof, know it is to better my judgment. A sentimentality or emotion would lessen my skill of observation. 
If you deem this unacceptable or insubordinate, then relieve me of my position and seek another. Please, your highness, I beg, do not rush the answer. Give it consideration. Bradmore, I wish you to stay. Friend? Friends, help me to bed. The prince nearly collapses with exhaustion as Bradmore helps him back to the bed. I had witnessed the warrior, the intellect, and at last, the boy. The boy whose life pulses with the spark of the very young and the very determined. To be king and have had a life of absolute power and certainty, the encroachment of death must be all the more horrific. To reach the final shocking realization, you shit like any other man, you piss like any other man, and you rot like any other man. After a life ordained by God, you lie on your deathbed, knowing it was an illusion and you were never in control. I suppose every generation has to learn and has been lied to by the previous. If we were told the truth by our parents, who would elect to have children? When my wife died, I couldn't help her. I didn't know what to do. As a man of medicine, I felt so, so very small. Mine, please. Grandmore, are you all right? Yes, yes, of course. I, I will fetch it up. How long have I been asleep? The better part of a day. Your Highness, might I say, it has been my good fortune to serve and to expand the horizons of my art. But I never, in all my wildest dreams, believed I should be permitted to age, aid a personage of your stature. I scarce can draw breath. Please breathe. In fact, I command it. As you wish. <sighs> don't, don't make me laugh. The pain is unbearable. If it were acceptable to your highness, I would have you call me by my given name, John, or if you prefer something less formal, Jonathan, or John, the less formal, John, 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 John it is, and uh, your Highness? Yes, John. Given the situation and the proximity with which we will work, might I call you Harry? No. <laughs> oh, of course not. We will never be that good of friends. Oh, allow me to rephrase. My station and your time in prison would never allow it. How do we go about this? Pardon? I'm not so sure about this notion of friendship. It can be quite pleasurable. Oh, you've done this before. Yes, Your Highness. I have made a friend or two in my lifetime. Get on with it. Friendship. Yes. Well, uh, I've been told it's quite simple. I'm listening. I claim no expertise. After all, I live and work in a practice that requires the head to rule the heart. How so? Squeamish surgeons do not inspire confidence. I suppose not. Well, in literature, uh, for example, friendship more or less happens. Good. Has it started? <laughs> I've never had the experience of choosing it. It seems, given a short period, to choose you. How so? It's a function of time. Two lads, such as ourselves, although your age is closer to being a lad than mine, spend time together and a mutual fondness grows. As the days progress, the bond grows stronger. Out of friendship might blossom a sort of gentlemanly love. Bradmore. Your Highness. I am not courting. <laughs> I simply wish to engage in a bit of banter. Of course. And I am not a raging sodomite. Nor I. And I should be greatly distressed were I to wake up tomorrow and find myself in the receipt of a love sonnet wrought by your hand. 
<clears throat> My love is like a river. It flows and flows. Oh, 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 oh. My love is like the, the wind. It blows and blows. Oh, 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 oh. My love is like the winter. It snows and snows. Oh, 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 oh. You know my poem. <laughs> That's a very distinctive feature. My love is like a boat. It, it rows and, and rows. Oh, 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 wait. A boat does not row of its own accord. It must be <laughs> rowed. Not if it's a sailboat. Sailboats ride the wind and do not require the act of rowing. However, sail does not rhyme with row or any O for that matter. Well, I am aware. Your way makes for very poor poetry. What compelled you to write? I was in love. Oh, with a death row. The good wife Bradmore. She still married you after that poetic atrocity? <laughs> I will have you know she hailed me a veritable Orpheus. Who should only be permitted to write for the underworld. <laughs> before you make a better surgeon than a poet. Oh, I am very sore. Point to the pain. Bradmore crosses behind him and begins a gentle examination. Careful, tender. Tell me. The arrow shaft, when removed, did it come out in one piece? The wood did not splinter. Good. We are looking for only one object. And the arrow. No one can get to it. Too deep. Aye. Deep enough, I may be buried with that bit of whales. What methods have been tried? The funneling of scorched fat. To enlarge the wound. It failed. Another man of medicine suggested easing the shaft back into the gash. Realigning the shaft into the arrowhead, taking a wooden mallet, giving the dowel a good whack, and sending the shaft quills and all out of the back of my skull. They didn't try it. I wasn't fond of the idea. Nor I. Is there anything else I should know? I had the last bloodletting a day ago. Did it help? Difficult to tell. I'm always so tired. Are you eating? Chewing is an effort. Cold water can be excruciating, like a blow to the manly bits. Descriptive. I need to probe the damage and get a sense of how deep the arrowhead lies. That requires an insertion of a finger into the wound. You will use your shortest finger? Unfortunately, no. Just the opposite. Will it hurt? Most assuredly. Bradmore, I've changed my mind. I prefer you lie to me. I could give you something to bite. Do it. He hands the prince a bite stick. Bradmore spits on his finger and then inserts it into his mouth. What are you doing? Moistening the finger. Why? Easier to insert. Turn this way. Bradmore removes the bandage and maneuvers the prince to a sitting position. Bradmore places his fingertip on the wound and the prince's body goes taut. At first, the wound rejected my search. Bradmore slightly twists. The prince winces and gasps. Once entry had been made, it slid inward. Bradmore twists again, causing the prince to cry out. The wound narrowed considerably. Okay. Bradmore twists once more, causing the prince to start panting. I'm going to pass out. Inches from his brain. I felt his body contract with the ebb and flow of pain. It seemed that should I reach further, the pad of my finger would feel his thoughts before they had time to form. He strained, wanting to rip his head from my grasp. Be still. If you squirm about, it will only make it worse. Be still. Get it out and be done. When I count three, I will give it a good tug. Stay where you are. Get on with it. One, one, two, two, three. Three. What are you doing? Get your finger out of my head. I'm trying. We're supposed to remove it on three. I know. It's stuck. Out. Bradmore slowly pulls. The prince screams. I... Just a little more. Bradmore breaks free. The prince writhes in pain. Ugh, that was horrible. There, there. Try and rest. It hurts. Blindly hurt. Here I was, knuckle deep in the skull of royalty. I wasn't touching history. 
I was probing it. We look to the young as our future, a noble sentiment, but the skill that had been, the skull that had been in my hand is the future of England. The realization shook me. Did you reach the arrowhead? I am afraid not. Bradmore. Sire? You're shaking. Cold. See to yourself. I'm in no condition to be taken care of you. Of, of course. What next? All progress is at a halt until the depth of the wound is established. I see. An alternate approach is needed. How do you say? Under, over, or around the fortification? Bradmore removes a jar and bits of wood and cloth from his satchel. What have you there? A probe to gauge the depth of the arrowhead, and with luck, the entrance of the wound. No finger? I need something thinner than the arrow shaft. You're fashioning a poker? Elderwood, imported from France. A tree branch is your solution. The pit. I use various lengths, wrap them in purified linen, and infuse them with rose honey. It makes the entry far easier work. At least I'll have a sweet-smelling corpse. No need for incense and myrrh. If you insist on moving your lips, at least employ them in prayer. I need all the help I can get. Do you pray, Red One? Yes. Is your wife? She did, my lord. Did? As in the past? She is no longer amongst us. I am sad to hear it. I shall pray for her. That is most kind. Your wife, she, she was a goodly woman? The very best. She bore me a son. He would have been a bit older than you. Did he follow in your path? There was never a chance. He died at birth. I shall pray for him. Thank you, my lord. My mother was barely of age when she birthed me. She died when I was a good boy. I shall pray for her. She never saw the throne. She would have been proud. Mary was her name. She was a partial heiress to a fortune in Land and Coin. Family legend has it my grandfather and his brother Thomas were rivals. If Thomas purchased a cow, grandfather would immediately purchase two cows. If grandfather said the weather was lovely, Thomas would argue it was going to rain. So Thomas wed Mary's older sister and inherited half the family fortune. But that was not enough. He wanted to keep all the estate, and to ensure it, he placed Mary in a convent. Not unusual for an unmarried girl. Well, grandfather was not about to let a single copper slip through his fingers. He went to the convent, rousted Mary, carried her out over his shoulder like a sack of turnips, fought off a gaggle of angry nuns, took her home, introduced her to my father, told my father he was to marry her, and then had him married before nightfall. The nuns were displeased. He drove them to Percy. Your mother was a young bride. Extremely young. That's the only reason grandfather didn't marry her. You know, that, in fact, he was already married. Mind you, marriage never interfered with his dalliances. His Plantagenet sword was legendary, and he frequently trotted it out for a bit of thrust and chop, <laughs> flying with enough drink, and he was fairly game to show it to any lady who desired to gaze upon it. He married four times and sired as many bastards as he fathered legitimate children. He could barely remember their names. I believe the sum total was 14. Quite prolific. He could have single-handedly populated the Canterbury Tales. <coughs> Birthing and killing. The Lancastrian forte. I take it you were the firstborn. No. My mother conceived the year of her betrothal at 14. They were to wait until she was 16 to consummate what was the family history of patience. My father did not leave that field that low. She had a baby and died. A boy. Never had a name. A brother I never knew. A brother who would be king. How came you to be wounded? Crushing rebellion is a nasty affair. The Welch are a ferocious people. Have you ever engaged in hand-to-hand -hand fighting? My place is with the wounded and dying. No taste for blood? Not of my own making. It can be a glorious thing. I find little pleasure attending such a spectacle as if it were a passion play or a sport. Once your enemy realizes they've been out maneuvered, there's a, a look that comes into their face with complete shock. <laughs> the battle's won at that point. 
only the business of killing is left. When I led my forces into Wales to do battle with Owen Glendower, the rebel. Owen Glendower? I. He's possessed. Some say he's a sorcerer. Tis true. Then he does command spiritual forces. Oh, aye. You've witnessed his dark power. He did conjure one trick on the battlefield. Tell me. He fled in retreat faster than any mortal I've ever encountered. I was being serious. Well, so am I. He fairly flew, <laughs> all the while bleeding like the goat he is. Tis not sensible you were there at all. Glindower is a man. You are but a boy. I resent the implication. With all due respect, you can barely shave. My father thought me capable. How old are you? Fifteen. Or thereabouts. Fifteen. Perhaps sixteen. Possibly seventeen. Perhaps fourteen. Maybe thirteen. You don't know. No one bothered to report it. You jest. Bradmore, at the time I was not in line for the throne. What does the date of my birth matter? A record would have taken little time. I might have died in arrival. Plenty of families forego birth celebrations. But you are not like other families. You grow tiresome. And here you are wounded. This is the price of your father putting a boy at peril. How else would you have me learn to be king? You think you read a book and there you have it. Of course not. You lead in the field. Men respect naked aggression. To directly engage the enemy at your age. Richard II was ten when he ascended the throne. Only because his father died. And my being at war saved mine. At great risk to yourself. Are you asking me to doubt the king's intentions? Oh, who puts their child in harm's way? I am not a child! A man-boy, then, if it makes you feel better. Heed your place, Bradmore. It is irresponsible. Silence! I have given you sufficient answer. Thank you, please forgive me. Deus meus, exto recorde me. Me omnium me orum negatorum. Me anche de testo, qui et peccando. Since the injury, I have changes of mood I cannot control. Prayer helps. And confession, perhaps. When a ten-year-old Richard came to the throne, grandfather was denied the full position of regent to his nephew. Parliament knew my grandfather would only do what was in his best interest. He vowed the crown would be ours again. Your birth was hidden. Richard's dominion was unstable. He was wary of any action out of the norm. So your grandfather might have been discovered. To record the birth of a child not in line with the throne would have been suspect. Given our proximity to the crown, it, it may have been perceived as treason. Aha. Uh -huh. Why make a record of a child insignificant to history? Exactly. We may all be Plantagenet, but gatherings for saintly feasts among the houses of York and Lancaster have become a bit strange. The Percy clan originally supported my father's claim. Surprising. A sufficient army was raised. Richard dethroned, and out of the clutter emerged father, wearing the crown. A triumphant day. It was the moment their relationship with the Percy skewed. Traitors, every last one of them. They are family. I shed not a tear for their fate, as they would shed none in my demise. If not for them, I should never have been in this place. God chose you as victor. There is no divinity behind our cause. The Percys agreed to fight for family assets, not to displace a monarch. They were formidable. And to meet the king's strength, well, they recruited Cheshiremen. Cheshire archers. Loyal to Uncle Richard. No. Trained by the crown. Now turned on the crown. Precisely. The English longbow used on Englishmen. I shudder to think. On the day of battle, he was piercing, coffined in armor. I, I was fairly roasted alive. My cloth garments sagged with the weight of sweat. Where did you meet? Three miles north of Shrewsbury, a, a place called uh, Haley Field. Excellent land for farming. Uh, good, good earth, well tilled, and planted with peas. Uh, too pastoral for war. It seemed a sacrilege to render a field intended to nourish. Under the weight of armor and horse, the plants were mashed to a pulpy green. You could hear pods snapping. Peas spew a 
dewy, unripe pungencies and nausea. I cannot have defied vegetables. The horse dung alone was enough to blur my vision. Was there no avoiding bloodshed? The father sent an abbot to offer terms. The Percys argued with the abbot. They argued a father. They argued amongst themselves. The father had enough. With the wave of his hand, drums began pounding, banners snapping, horns blasting, and both horses drew nearer the other to make ready to clash. <laughs> You've never seen it. It's a highly civilized affair. Both armies allowed the other to hold in a com comfortable distance, far enough to respect the opponent, yet close enough to ensure the mount won't tire of the charge. Of course, once in place, the glove of civility is tossed. Taunts, jives, songs of wayward mothers, and all manner of general disparagement are traded. More like a tournament than a battle. At the ready, all the men place the visors in the down position. This moment is like no other. Armor makes one intensely aware of drawing breath. You hear and feel the cycle of it as it grows shallower with each breath. All I can think is I itch, I'm sweating, I shall go mad if something doesn't happen. You actually wish for the battle to begin. I want resolution. Even so, father lifts his sword. For one moment, there is no sound. A signal flag cracks the silence, and archers on both sides begin to notch their arrows and draw. And while a drawn bow emits no clatter, the strain of sinew on wood palpably vibrates. The archers release, creating the thrum of bowstring and the hiss of a thousand snakes as fletching brushes you wood. Bradmore, do you know what every man does in this situation? You watch. You watch as the shafts hit, sail toward their peak in the sky. I would flee. You can't. It's mesmerizing, beautiful, and lethal. In the first volley, there's an instant where arrows of either force can ascend no further and hover as if in greeting before they cross paths and hurtle downward. And thrall, you can try and convince yourself that you could catch an arrow with your hands. Snatch it from the breeze like a butterfly riding a gust. It's the thud of earth and arrow and man meat that snaps you back. Metal tips saw flesh like they could smell it. Men fell like autumn leaves. God help us. Then the charge. A blur of humanity and horse, smashing and jostling for position. Under the weight of the armor, the horse is slow to start, but once to speed, the mass becomes an asset, giving the mound additional momentum. You ride uncontrollably with neither beast nor man in charge. The forward thrust becomes so great, the only way to stop is to hurtle into the wall of death before you. With no other choice, you plunge forward, ripping great chunks of terrain with every stride. The hooves beat the earth like thunder. How do you signal? Well, you don't. You're screaming. You scream to drown the screams of the opposition, drown the screams of your brethren, drown the screams of horses, and drown the screams of the dying. Your own voice, trapped in armor, sounds foreign and echoes so much upon itself you no longer hear or recognize it. You scream so loud and so long you are deafened by it, terrifying while you're never more alive. At contact with the enemy, the bowels release from fear and necessity. Within the arm, I, there's no shame because there's no choice. From within, the pummeling of armor with arrow, sword, and spear sounds like hail <laughs> on stone. Riding in and out of blood sprays, I was splattered with tiny sap drops which clung to the metal and became hard baked by the sun. How came you to be injured? A blank helmet. You can't see, there are two slits for eyes, but when on a charging steed, the earth bounces in and out of view like windows on a ship or a storm. Sometimes your vision's no further than the man to the right or left. I've been in battle, not certain I was galloping in the right direction. But when did you enter the fray? It wasn't long into the fight before the right wing began to crumble. Seeing an opening, the Percy's charged with the king, we beat them back. As the Percy line began to falter, I rewarded myself. It was a stupid gesture. I knew better it was pride. I underestimated the enemy. It is of no consequence. Trapped in armor, I wanted nothing more but to breathe clean air. It lifted my visor. Understandable. The right, 200 yards away, is a young man dressed in peasant gear. Friend or foe? I couldn't tell. The afternoon sun was behind him. Oh no. In one motion, his bow was notched and drawn. You saw it? Shot from 200 yards away, the arrow had time to gain full thrust. It quivered slightly, leaving the bow quickly adjusted itself while spiraling toward me. It collided with my left cheek with such force I snapped backward. I felt my spine slap the full length of the mount's massive backbone. My 
helmet banged against the rump, sending the animal exploding forward. And you? I was a marionette with puff strings. The horse threw you. My hand became entangled in the reins. I, I barely managed to pull myself to sitting. Any other man would have passed out. All I could think was, I have an arrow in my face. I have an arrow in my face. God in heaven, I have an arrow in my face. At the same time, I'm relieved there's no pain. I'm very aware of it being there, but it doesn't hurt. It would soon enough. I lifted the visor flap, but it fell forward, making the arrow vibrate pain to the length of my skull. I left it down against the wood bar, but in its position, while the visor was partially open, the shutter of the horse caused it to flip-flap against the shaft, equally painful. Grabbing the arrow, I could not tear it free, but only managed to jerk my head about. This is very painful. My efforts only alarmed the horse. But what did you do? Well, I calmed enough to realize that if I allowed my gaze to follow the shaft, I could make out a bit of ground. So as I rode, head down, I could see a line of blood crawl the length of the shaft. Left at the butt of the arrow until the weight of it became so great it fell to earth. My face became dull. It tasted blood. Last thing I remember is hearing drip, drip, drip against the chest plate. It was said that by the end of the battle, so much English blood had spilled, your father was unsure which side had won. I ask in all sincerity, did we carry the day? Your defense of the right flank assured victory. So much death in the bright light of day. And the Percy's? You do not know? I've been told nothing. The leader of the rebellion, his body was salted and impaled on a spear in Shrewsbury Market. When the birds have their fill, he is to be quartered, and his head spiked on the York North Bar, so he might gaze on his ancestral home. I see. I thought you would be pleased. Better them than I. Someone should pray for them. Pray for us. Pray for us all. Ave Maria. Gracia plena. Dominus. Take on Benedicta, to in Mulieribus, Benedictus. The prince starts choking. Bradmore helps him to lie down and wipes him up. Bradmore sits at the table and writes. Given the impact and the proximity of the arrow when released, the arrowhead is surely lodged in the bone itself at the rear of the skull. The path of the wound is so narrow that to insert tongs of any sort will not work. They are simply too wide. Should I somehow manage to wedge a pair of tongs into the wound once in, I have not room enough to expand them to grasp the arrowhead. If the arrowhead is trapped or bound by bone, there is no possibility of expanding the area surrounding it. I have considered leaving the arrowhead in place, but at this state, any hope that the body will simply absorb it and right itself seems unlikely. The prince jerks in his sleep and then awakes in a panic. I had a dream. There is nothing to fear. Take your ease. My mouth filled with blood. It was only a dream. Unable to speak, I, I could not confess. Dreams are not truths. Blood was replaced by sin. Sin, wet and alive. Dribbling from my mouth, spewing the length of my gown, making the garment cling to my naked body, bathing me. Shh. I knew I was dying Shh. when it trickled to a stop. Peace. Brushed the damp hair from my face, took my chin and gently kissed me on the lips. Shh. With the other hands, he began to pull the jaw downward. They cried out, but he leaned his full weight against the bone until I could hear it snap. Enough. Enough. Shh. You're safe. I'm here at your side. Nothing shall happen to you. Let me show you something. An idea I've had. Bradmore reaches into his bag and removes a metal spoon, a ruler, and a stick. This is how you comfort me. Great thoughts, born of simplicity. Metal flatware. You possess such finery. For measuring remedies. Now, take your hand and hold it thus. Good. Hold it there. 
Your hand represents the socket of the arrowhead. A bit large, don't you think? Make the hole smaller. Now, imagine the width of this spoon handle to be less than the width of a quill stripped of its feathers. Next to the spoon, we have a counterpart of similar width and length. Allow the measure to serve in this capacity. The width of the entire instrument is now less than that of my finger and can easily slip into the wound and from there into the socket. Cradled between the, the spoon and the measure is a thin rod. Once the spoon and measure are in the socket, we push the rod downward to force the outer objects against the socket wall. When the arrowhead is secure, we extract it. What will it be made of? I need access to craftsmen and fire. You have a metal forger on site. Aye. Good. A bit of bad news, I'm afraid. Yes? I was not able to ascertain the depth of the wound. To properly calculate the length of the instrument, I need to probe. Please. It will not hurt as it did before. I have bits of elderwood and rose honey I've prepared. The honey should smooth the entrance of the pit and act as a restorative. You must. Lie down. Bradmore begins to tie rope to both sides of the headboard and makes a small noose in each. What's this? Restraints. Their purpose? To prevent you flailing about. I shall hold firm. As you did with the finger. I'll summon manly courage. The bindings are for your own protection. I have no fear. The bindings are for my protection. If you insist. I do. The prince lies on the cot. Bradmore slips the prince's wrist into the rope and makes them taut. He takes several towels and places them around the prince's face. Bradmore holds up the probe, examining the length. Steady. As Bradmore inserts the probe, the prince's body goes rigid. His hands grasp the bedding and squeeze till shaking. As the probe continues, the prince arches in pain. His breath pistons in and out. Done. As the probe is removed, the prince collapses in a ball, panting. His body suffers spasms he seems unable to control. Bradmore frees his wrists. You can rest now. My body leaves me little choice. Be light of heart. We have a plan. It will not be long now. You will be able to look back at Shrewsbury and have the final laugh. God willing, you will outlive them all. Perhaps with the what end? To be king. Percy's wanted to be king. It was not their place. Is my father so different? I cannot speak to that. Is this what it is to be king? To trust no one? To rely on no one? To have spies, to have spies spying on your spies, doing battle with neighbors, cousins, executing uncles. If it is Richard II of whom you speak, he wronged your father. Give him not another thought. How can you say that? I say it with a clear conscience. He was weak of strength, morality, and character, neither deserving of a crown nor able to lead with the nation's care in mind. I am sure your highness has right well heard the rumors. What rumors? He spent his time solely in the company of men. In fact, they were his preference in the marital bed. Shame. Tis true. Shame be to you. You should thank God in heaven that your father is king. You would do well to keep a civil tongue in your head when you speak of my family. Richard is buried and forgot, and England better for it. Richard was a king and ordained by God. And when you speak of him, you will speak of him with the reverence of a king, by his proper title and in the manner of the servant you are. His prison taught you nothing. You will do as I say, or by God I will watch you slowly burn. The prince collapses in Bradmore's arms. Bradmore carries him back to the cup. Your Highness. Bradmore? Yes, I'm afraid. Of course. I don't want to die. Please, do not let me die. Angela Dei, be custos es me, me tibi comisum pietate, supernum, supernum. 
I can't, I can't finish, help me. Superna, illumina, kistori, rege e guberna. Amen. The light leads to black. Act two. Your Majesty, I wish to thank. Indeed, we are nearing a fortnight. Your son? Ah. The prince was struck with an armor piercing arrow. This type of arrowhead is very small and shaped like a square nail. How do I explain? A square nail has four sharp edges which allow it to cut further into timber, making a stronger fixing than a round nail. The same principle applies to an arrowhead. Once embedded in flesh, the four sides of the arrowhead prove additional flat surface area for the body to swell around and bind to. This causes the arrowhead to be pulled further into the body. Once the shaft is removed, the wound closes over itself and buries it. The prince's arrowhead lies six inches deep in the interior bone of the skull posterior. Over the last few days, I have devised what I believe to be a solution, a method never before tried. However, it is with great trepidation I report, it is my experience that head injuries of this sort almost always prove fatal. I am aware that I've been given a second chance. The lights fade down on Brad Morton, fade up revealing the prince. His bandage has been restored. He awakes and calls for Brad Morton. Realizing he is alone, he rises and crosses to the table and begins to read from Brad Moore's notes. The more he reads, the more he agitated he becomes. He removes the bandage. As he reads, he gently probes his face trying to determine the extent of the wound. Each passage sends his fingertips to a different portion of the face. He reads, then probes, reads, then probes. When he can read no more, he pulls the hand away and stares at it, then wipes the hand against his gown. He pours water into the bowl on the table, maneuvering the bowl in hopes of capturing a glimpse of his face. Failing, he goes to Bradmore's satchel and rummages. He finds a hand mirror but hides the face of the mirror against his chest. He slowly brings the mirror into position to see his face. When the mirror is in position, he freezes for a moment. My God. Give me that. It's not what you think. What were you doing? I wanted a drink. Did you expect to find a fountain of water in my bags? No. You've gone through my notes. I had to know if you were being forthright with me. And what do you conclude? No, not entirely. You had no right to do this. I have every right, given your recent imprisonment. It is for your own protection. You will know certain things when I deem you need to. My face is hideous. You are seeing it at its worst. You are young. If I have the time, I should be seeking a wife. Your youth will help you heal faster. And with salves and massage, we can keep the skin and muscles supple. Oh, my scar? That I cannot know. The, the, the truth. Yes, you will scar. I am certain of it. Who will want me? You will be king. But who will want me? All women will want you. You sure? Your Highness, decorum prevents me elaborating on what unspeakable things women will do to whet your appetite. I speak not of sin, but of marriage. I think you should first focus on recovery. Mm -hmm. Brad Moore? Your Highness. I have a question. Yes? It's of great import. I will do my best to answer. I have to be taken seriously. Of course. What we speak of is to be kept in confidence. Without question, Bradmore. Do you know much in regards to women? Their anatomy? The heart, specifically. 
It is a very strong muscle, my lord. The elements of the heart, rather. Science knows little about it, my lord. Love? Science knows nothing about it, my lord. Well, then, appealing to the heart of a woman. I am not a proper tutor. I know nothing about it, my lord. Well, the tenets of romance. I consider my lack of verbosity with women a virtue. I have devoted my life to the avoidance of romance. What did you say to win your wife? I do. There's more to it. This beard is gray, and any expertise gray with it. You've at least been married. What difference does it make? I wish my future bride to like me. What difference does it make if she likes you? You will be king. Well, we'll have to sire children. Again, I ask you, what difference does it make if she likes you? You will be king. Can I ask? It might be best to have a healthy hatred of her. I'm finished. It worked for past monarchies. In fact, I can't think of a pair that got along. You swore to take me seriously. Aren't these things decided for you? Chances are, to appease a diplomatic crisis, you'll marry to some foreigner who never had the decency to learn God's English. You won't understand a word she says, and therefore, lucky man, you, may, you are under no obligation to talk with her. Indeed. She's Welsh, it's a hopeless venture. Who can follow a word of that? It sounds like a cat hacking up fur. Welsh blood flows in this body. I hadn't realized. You speak like an angel, my lord. Am I to believe you conducted your marriage in silence? No. Mrs. Bradmore talked incessantly. In fact, she never hesitated to offer an opinion or an instruction regarding my improvement. Her mastery of the subject spilled out regardless of time or occasion. It's quite traditional between men and women. Hardly. It is preferable. No talk means no spats. Happy be the marriage wrapped in silence. Oh, I had not considered that. I do but just, Your Highness. Your point is well made. If I am to have a wife I'm not to understand, I would fancy a French wife. Not much for the Frenchie's tongue. <laughs> Damnable hard to chew that language. But I do like the way it prattles. When directed toward compliments, it is pleasant enough. It seems the most minuscule of all sends the French into a tirade of cooing, honking, and spitting. Seldom can I decide if they're in the throes of passion or angered with the world. The latter, Your Highness. The French are perpetually angry. Indeed. Can you not reason why? No. They smell. Of cheese. <laughs> well, there is strong breeding in their breed. I once attended a woman from Milan who smelled of garlic and sausage. Off putting? On the contrary, I fell instantly in love. You might say her tang tickled me from nose to toes in a way that blood pudding never could. <laughs> so you contemplated an affair? Not at all. I may have been inspired to eat her, but only in the most platonic manner possible. John Bradmore liked his mutton for all. <laughs> Something tells me you know more than you let on. Shouldn't your father be the one to teach you in the ways of courtly love? What would he know? His first marriage was arranged, and the second nuptial managed by proxy. Once married, it took her two years to arrive in England. Romance was not at the forefront. Nor is, is it an issue for you. Let it alone. How do you... How do I what? Do you know what I'm trying to ask? No. How to mount? Yes. Mount a, a lady. I knew that was where this was headed. How do you know when she's right for mounting? <laughs> you don't just walk into a room and mount a lady. You <coughs> can. It just makes them cranky and less apt to do it again. Is it a matter of training? But do not look away. Who would answer such a question of their prince if not you? The priests are of no help. The king barely talks to, me, talks to me, and when he does, the subject of rutting has never been at the forefront. You swear you have no knowledge of the subject. Jokes and body songs have been my tutelage. I will not be made a fool. I spent the majority of my youth with Uncle Richard, who, as you so aptly put, preferred the bum to the bush. Go observe the 
beasts in the field. A pig does not arouse my passion. You mock me. Grandpa, please. How honestly, I, I do not know. I cannot. As your prince, I command you to tell me how to make a woman game for the hunt. You know that men and women are different. I'm not a simpleton. You're not a scholar, either. I understand the physical body. It's the flaring passion that interests me. If I tell you, will you rest? Forgive me. I'm waiting. It's quite simple. You take your hand and put it between her thighs. Thighs. Then do a bit of rubbing. Back and forth? Possibly. <laughs> round and round is good. Or up and down. If you like. They seem to prefer a variety. Do you rub fast or slow? I don't know. Don't I rub the hair away? It's not meant to be quite that furious. It's not a hunting dog to be thumped. Think of it as a, a flower. A, a flower petal to be stroked with the tip of the finger. You stroke flowers? It's merely a suggestion to conjure the temperance of a gesture. I'm to imagine stroking flowers? No, I'm not at all interested in that. You will be. How will I know when she's ready? Look at her. It'll be evident on her face. Then what? If she's happy, you mount her. The rest will make sense once you're there. This is how you advise me. What did you expect? More of a surgeon. I fix fractures, I do bloodlettings, and perform the odd amputation or two. I have nothing to do with what goes on down there with a woman. Very well, make a joke of it. I didn't know I'd be serving proxy and teaching you how to master the game of cup and ball. You have yet to provide a proper answer. The ball goes in the cup. Play cup and ball. <laughs> Very well, then. And this is the last I'm going to say on the subject. It's like pouring wine. Fill the vessel till it overflows. Your cheeks are red. You talk too much. I find it impossible to believe you know nothing of carnal pleasure. I speak the truth. All young men are obsessed. Not all. Even I know royal chambermaids do more than turn the bedding. The manner and mode is not an issue. It is the bonds of feeling and respect that elude me. I doubt it, my lord. Why must serious inquiry of the subject be negated and reduced to buffoonery? <laughs> you are hardly serious. Should I, in ignorance, set about to litter the countryside with bastards? It worked for your grandfather. And grow tolerant of assaults in the marketplace. You were accosted in the marketplace by a puppet show. Puppets accosted you. Sensibilities. <laughs> During the puppet show, a large phallus was put on trial for bedding a woman and making her grave a child. <laughs> the phallus was found guilty of wantonness and sentenced to prison. Once clapped in irons, the phallus began to weep and beg for pity. <laughs> the woman, swept with emotion, forgave the phallus, as it had been very kind to her in the past and gave her many wondrous nights that brought a smile to her cheek. <laughs> How fortunate for the fornicating phallus! To demonstrate my point. My lord, it is merely a bit of fun to relieve the tension of a prickly subject. The implications slice far deeper. You're being silly. You find this humorous? A trace? The children <laughs> were present. I was unaware. Priests and nuns joined the merriment. How unfortunate! They laughed and clapped! <laughs> I know not what to say. <laughs> Did you hear me? Clergymen, members of the church, laughed and clapped for a cankered genital. <laughs> Is this funny? No, uh, of course not. Well, when you say it in that manner, <laughs> God witness their sin. And surely will punish them. It sickens me that the bestial sin of Adam and Eve should be of such little regard. Indeed. And morality placed in the hands of the corrupt. It was an entertainment. That all entertainments should be halted. You disagree? It is not my place. How calm and careless we've become. Time and
prison has taught you little. Forgive me, but a mere puppet show does not threaten the realm. Moral degeneracy does. The country erodes from within. Wycliffe has decimated our spiritual center, leading Englishmen from God like starving beggars to free mutton. How did the conversation turn so ugly? Pardon, but your highness is not in his right mind. Your wound has made you tired. Your thoughts feverish, and you slur the very words you intend to injure me. I am perfectly fit. Your father may differ in opinion. And it has come to this. My lord, you threatened me with my father. If you continue, who do you think taught me? The king educated you to fear puppets. Ah. When he is strength and courage itself, tempered with terror and raw violence, to accomplish the throne and to hold it by battle, blood and broadsword. Bosh. What other lesson is there to be gleaned of Harry Monmouth's life? I watch cousins swear allegiance with one hand while drawing a blade with the other. What do you know of the ways of men? You are but a boy, and I a boyhood. I never got to play it for Bradmore. I spent my youth making it. I've tasted my own blood in battle, taken and spared life, and now face mortality. In the future, might I suggest you choose the option to make peace with the enemy? Ireland, Wales, Scotland, England, we all have a bit of this land, but no one wants to share it with the others. There will be no peace until there is one victor. You're right. The notion is impossible. Sticking or wielding a knife point is far less complicated, more satisfying, and the results more permanent. Peace is merely the pause before the next war. Who are you? One minute to the next, it's as if you've been conjured from the role of dear sweet boy to ravening wolf. Bradmore, we live in dangerous times. Peace is a luxury I have not tasted in many a year, and my adversaries would do well to keep me from the table. Punishing or embracing whales does not change the fact we are but an island just as vulnerable to outside attack as internal destruction. Since the age of the Romans, this land has been subject to war. Even now, the enemies in France, Spain, and Italy have spies roaming the countryside in poor delight. Many speak our native tongue better than you and I, and dress more English than most Englishmen. We fight an adversary we cannot see. The mistakes of your forebearers do not have to be yours. Learn. I will. I have. I did. In the Lord of Helen's Rebellion, Richard's army was defeated. The mob had the courage to rise up, but their leader lacked the fortitude to execute a king. Richard overthrew them without mercy. He crushed those who opposed him, save one, the leader, a family member turned traitor. His first cousins, the two played, rode, ate, studied, and even joined the Order of the Garter together. Nineteen years ago, Richard had my father, Henry Bolingbroke, by the follies. At a loss, Uncle Richard could have ended it all. The entire family in a blink. Instead, he forgives precious cousin Harry. What is the lesson? Whether friend, foe, or family, you do not let traitors live. Has all your compassion vanished? Do not mistake me, Bradmore. I am no feeble Richard. You or anyone else cross me, and whatever imagined kinship you believe us to have will fly from my heart, making my resolve harden like steel. I promise, should you attack your king, for to attack your king is to attack England itself. You will be exposed and shamed in the presence of your countrymen. You will be denied all sacrament of holy right, and your sin before God left unresolved, so that as you are eliminated from this earth, you die fully in the knowledge salvation can never be attained, and your mortal soul will be cast into hell. What did these men do to you? They readied me for the throne. By encouraging you to embrace the rapture of war, who are you to say God has not blessed the act? The Bible is filled with battles and bloodshed. God would not allow you to forego the rules of civility. There are no rules in war. The purpose of war is to physically and spiritually overwhelm your opponent in such a manner as to break their resolve and force them to surrender as quickly as possible. One does not fight war in small bites but in the jaws of complete aggression. To lack that resolve invites defeat. 
any less. The cost in materials, coin, and men is too costly. Too, too costly, and I hold it as I would a mortal sin. I neither invite, encourage, nor desire war. But be it known to the enemies of this realm, I will not run from it. Be you an Englishman, born of Englishmen, whose ancestors and their ancestors before them date back as far as time may recall, and who may comprise the very clay we trod. Should they defy this realm, or act in a manner that would place their king and countrymen in jeopardy, their treasons will be viewed no less than that of any foreign rival. For by turning against England, they shun their right to share our good name. What are you thinking? What is Bradmore thinking? Nothing. You lie. You cannot know that. Every muscle in your body screams it. Are my thoughts not my own? Come. We'll make a game of it. I'd rather not. You're a sporting man. Not in matters of life and death. Might I guess, Monsieur Counterfeiter? Can I stop you? Let me see. You appear to have a trouble. Yes, yes, my lord. I have a troubled look. Well done, Anger. I would say so. Anger with a pinch of bewilderment. You're not sure you like me. Not at this moment. In fact, you're not so sure you want to save me. I am here. Easy enough to let me slip away. No one would suspect. I suppose not. You get your gold regardless of Monmouth lives or dies. Do I seem concerned with coin? Perhaps the king pardoned you to ensure I breathe my last, a counterfeiter? I will not dignify that statement. His retinue desires I replace him on the throne. This instant, if at all possible, they've tried poisoning him. The king knows it, and he wishes me dead. Enough! You go too far! You don't go far enough! Bradmore hurriedly crosses to the wooden box and removes the extractor. Here! This is it! What is it? It is so new it doesn't have a name. I made it for you, to save you. Looks ghastly. What are you afraid of? Torture? If the plan was to kill you, there has been ample opportunity. Get away from me. The tongs are your savior, forged in the same fire as the blade you carried into battle. Feel it. Take it in your palm. Take it. This is all that stands between you and death. It is as real as my loyalty. There is no conspiracy in which I am involved. There never was, nor never will there be. How will you manage it? How will I? I will do nothing. I am no longer needed. Our bond is quit. Any surgeon with a sure hand can utilize it. The difficulty was in the design. I will observe and act as guide. You are to perform the task, no one else. There is no excuse for my behavior. Clearly, I am not myself. But I am as I have been, and have never wavered. I am unworthy of your affection. Get up. Get up. I will do your bidding. Please. Forgive me? It is I who should ask forgiveness. We will not speak of it again. As you wish. The withdrawal of the arrowhead, how's it to be done? The instrument slides in, at the same angle as the arrow when it first entered. I center the middle screw over the socket of the arrowhead, where it is connected to the shaft, and then allow the tongs to slip inside the socket. Engage the screw, the tongs press against the sides of the socket, making for a firm grip. Gently rock it to and fro, and the arrow is free. Remove the tongs, and the arrow should fall. So simple. Yes. Almost elegant. Indeed. It looks painful. And no doubt shall be. This is to go inside my head. I could put it elsewhere. The pain would differ, but be no less. I loathe the sight of you. My face pains the prince. Your words. A good report from you always carries a promise of anguish. I'm glad to hear it. News can be altered while my face remains constant. <laughs> You're shaking. What if I should fail? It will not be the first. 
that I may be the last. Given your condition, I am in your hands. I never made such an utterance. Bradmore? Yes. And do not let me die. Lord. Oh, let me finish. Do not let me die with the stain of sin. Shall I send for a priest? You will serve well enough. I cannot. I wish to confess to, to you. That's an act of trust. I have not God's ear, nor I, since Richard's death. These transgressions you do not own. But I do. There is not room enough in hell to stack my sins. Only God can make that judgment. Bradmore. The Lord, no matter how much I might wish, I cannot absolve you. But you can take pity. We shall ask the saints to pray for my forgiveness. It was Richard who raised me. Father, I barely knew him. Home to him was crusading in the Holy Land. As was the case for many. And Uncle Richard taught me to ride, schooled me, gave me my first lesson with the hawk. I rode side by side with him in the campaign of Ireland. After the first battle, he knighted me. In many ways, he was more. Well, I know to think this is a sort of blasphemy. You have to understand, Richard provided me shelter, food, clothes enough, and an education. I, I loved him. It could not have been easy. And I loved my father. A boy is supposed to love his real father. Mutual affection is not a sin. I wish my father dead. You can't mean it. He allowed Richard to die horribly. There was no quick jab of the knife. That was lies spread by the crown. How do you know of this? Each day, a guard brought the king in the counting of Richard's state. You're becoming agitated. I must finish, please. Why did your father not kill Richard outright? God chose Richard. If God wanted Richard to live, then he would live. The hand of Henry Bolingbroke must remain utterly pure. The guard were ordered to feed Richard just enough to keep him alive. Each day, an imperceptible amount of food was shaved from the allotment of the day before. So small was the fraction, Uncle Richard's eyes could not construe the sight his belly agonized. In time, doubt with his senses reduced him to an imbecile. His hair grew brittle, teeth rained from his mouth, scratching and whining at the door he called and called for those he thought once loved him. His days developed into weeks, his brain soured. Prayers became songs, song became poetry, poetry became phrases, phrases became words, and words became a single vowel repeated over and over, then only sound, sort of, made by a baby. Months passed, and when the bits and pieces he was fed could no longer sustain him, Uncle Richard consumed his fingernails and his body scabs. Once they were picked over, he would vigorously claw his head till flakes fell like snow. Rolling the dander between thumb and forefinger, he glued them into tiny cakes using the jelly produced by his body. No bit that could be cannibalized went to waste. In time, his muscles vanished, urine slowed to a dribble, tears became tearless, and his breath took up the stench his bowels ceased to produce. Near the end, his daily offering was a vinegar-soaked rag, which tortured the sores of his parched throat and tortured his mind because his will could not refuse it. No longer able to, able to suckle, the guard wrung the dregs into his mouth as a washerwoman rids broadcloth of excess water. He died without sound. The king is dead. Long live the king. It's important to be that, that, that that be said, for it denotes the past is the past, and this reign has now begun. And the second took to pronounce it. He who says it first appears most loyal. It only makes one ruminate. Did this man love his king so little that he could only summon joy at his death and the coronation of another? You should not blame yourself. I could have brought him food. I could have pleaded for his life. I left him to die alone, afraid and unloved. Now it is my turn. I am a condemned. My lips fail with every utterance of prayer. Do you not understand? God has left me. I will pray for pray for King Richard. May God forgive you and bless your good name. 
Confiteor, Deo Omnipotenti, Beate Mariae Semper Virgini, Beato Michele Ar Arcangelo, Beato, Beato Ioanni Baptiste, Sanctis Apostolis et Petro et Paolo, Omnibus Sanctis et Vobis Frateris et Tibi Pater, qui et Peccato, Nimis Cogitatione, Verbo e Opere, Mea Culpa, Mea Culpa, Mea Maxima Culpa, Ideo, Precor, Beatum Mariam Semper Virginum, Beatum Michaelum Archangelum, Beatum Ioannum Baptistum, Sanctus Apostolus et Roman Paulum, Omnis Sanctus et Vos Fratre et Te Pater, Orare, Promea Ad Domini, Dea Nostra. Sure. Yes. As you wish. Will I see you afterward? I will not leave your side. A good man, Brad. Brad pours a cup of wine and anoints the prince's face. White wine to cleanse the wound. I'd rather share a glass than wear one. <clears throat> when you're healed, we shall raise a cup. That we shall. This is a mixture of bread, honey, and barley to speed the healing. If I should pass out, I will be here. When I awake, will I know how to mount a woman? No. Bradmore? Shh, please. What is it? Thank you, John. Godspeed. Dear boy, Bradmore steadies the prince's head and places his wrist into the restraints. Bradmore surveys the wound and experiments with the alignment. As the extractor enters the wound, the prince's breathing becomes ragged and his torso flails about, forcing Bradmore to have to subdue him. The pain is unbearable and the prince faints. Bradmore, with effort, plumbs the depth of the wound and then withdraws the extractor. He holds up the bloody arrowhead. He turns to the table and drops it into a bowl. We hear the prince breathing deeply. God save the king. He crosses himself and then begins praying as the lights fade to black. Trippy. That's trippy. 
Very Alice in Wonderland. All right, so, off the top, what are your overall impressions of, of, of the play? such a twist on that and really think about the humanity of somebody that you think of as a martial figure. Yeah. 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 You'd be in prison, but mostly if you were a debtor. Like debtor's prison was a thing, but if you committed a crime, you usually were like disfigured in some yeah, way. If you were a counterfeiter, if you were a counterfeiter, you'd probably be killed. So he like, and I was wondering if like the reason he wasn't was because he had treated John of Gaunt as was stated. I was like, maybe he got some kind of special pardon for being a counterfeiter because of that. So that was some things I was thinking about. Okay. Any other thoughts? It would be a cool parallel to, to yeah. the fact that so much of it is about the prince's disfigurement. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, how, do you, how did you feel the, the, the balance of the play was between the characters? I mean, did, it, what, did you feel it was lopsided at all? Or did you feel like it, between the two of them it, it, it worked pretty well? Well. I thought it I thought it worked very well. Um, it, it was interesting the juxtaposition where uh, Henry has been, you know, philosophizing, you know, in, in his education and Bradmore, his ideas are much more grounded, real everyday sort of thing. But at times it did strike me that uh, Henry's language, obviously he's been trained and brought up to be the next king, but for being so young. It wasn't just things that sounded like he had learned. It was like he's been intensely 
deeply thinking about these things. And I wonder if sometimes he might, as a 15-year-old, his thoughts might not have been slightly more childish at times. Although the extreme, the extreme uh, beliefs of him, you know, you're either all good or all bad, or you know, that does show a childishness. But it, it did seem very mature. It seemed o almost overly mature at occasionally. I'm just curious: is this is this based on historical fact, or is this an extrapolation or an idea? It's loosely based on historical fact. What's the fact? The wound itself, and, and yeah. that Bradmore removed it. Not <laughs> really, about as much as they know. It's, it's not necessarily the rest of it is mm -hmm. right. It's false. It's just that you don't know. So, so what you're saying as far as... Um, I there guess is definitely a record that he survived this exact kind of wound. Right, but as far as Bradmore, the fact is only his name associated with removing the arrow. Yeah, there's not oh, much okay. information on that. He did invent yeah. the, the thing. I'm like sorry? Brennan? Um, it is based on historical fact in terms of the, the, the wound itself that it happened. Um, the prince was in the of Cap of Tende. Brad Morton did create the extractor. Matter of fact, the extractor was actually used for the next 300 years to extract musket balls as late as the um, 1700s. Um, obviously, what happened in the Tende is the conversation between the two of them could never be known. And that's, of course, the um, playwriting skill was. You know, it's taking place in this one room between the two characters. It just seems a little odd. I kept thinking, oh, there must be another one who must be reporting to the king. Something will come of this direct conversation with the king, but it never really followed up. He just changed up the writing letters to report to the king. Yeah, that's, that's a 
possibility. But I, I thought kind of along the same lines when I first read the piece that maybe there was that particular scene led me to wonder a lot more about the question of was Brad Moore maybe not supposed to heal Prince? Um, and I actually felt like I kind of got distracted by that a little bit. I mean, I, in the end, I decided that interpretation didn't really ring true with how Brad Moore is at the end of the play. But it's, it's interesting to bring that up. I, su I suppose uh, my comment on the character relationship would be when I actually saw a kid talking to an older man, the kid being a kid and the older man being a father, they were very believable, very real. The biggest thing, I will, I'll go back to what you said, the biggest thing that disturbed the relationship for me was the language when he let uh, the king uh, get into philosophical statements in a very philosophical form of speech. And that's when I lost the character of a 15 year, as a matter of fact, when, I, when they said, oh, I'm 15 or 14, I was shocked because I was figuring at the beginning of the play that the kid was probably 18, 19, 20. So when, when the two relationships were clear and the age differences were clear, it worked beautifully well. The whole sex thing was just charming. Mm -hmm. It's when it became uh, kind of messagey <laughs> and pontificating that yeah. it bothered me. Or I didn't really buy it. Yeah, I mean, let me ask you, because the part to me that I, I felt the most conflicted about in this piece was the, the prince's long description of the battle. Um, when he gets into that in a really, I, part of me finds that language kind of invigorating and exciting, and part of me thinks it's maybe a little too much for somebody who's supposed to be 15 and badly wounded to be making that quite a have that sense yeah, no, I, I, I know what you mean. It, because it, I, I feel like the, the emotion behind that part really makes sense to me that you would be like, oh yeah, you know, battle's so cool, you know, even though I got shot in the face. Like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he's 15, so he's like, this is the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. You know? So, like, you know, I get that. But, like, but yeah, I mean, I, there are bits in there where, where I did feel like, would I really be talking like this for a 15 year old? You know, the very, you know, provoked, very well put together. Well, he'd already been to Oxford for two years. That's yeah. true. And he would have had a very like scholastic education, oh, I would right, assume, at that true. point. And I'm also yeah. not sure though that Brad Moore, having seen battles before himself, would be quite so taken in by the moment of the description of the battle as being quite as glorious. of Lion and Winter I saw when I was in middle school, um, where there was basically just black curtain set and then like one pillar, and then everybody had on period costume. So I could see it working that way. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think modern clothing might be a little distracting. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would work great with a minimal set. Um, you know, some cubes could be the bed, you know. Um, that would be great, but I mean, it would have to be full-on period clothing, like just something Reminiscent. suggestive of a different time. Gotcha. Yeah. Like still sort of simple, but yeah. Just sort of yeah. I don't think I have a problem with modern clothing mm -hmm. for this. I, I, yeah, two blocks in the background, that's all, that's all I need. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this, I guess uh, maybe you can clarify for us, is the, qu is the intent in asking that, that you're hoping to see modern parallels in the piece, or? Yeah. Okay. Um, or she may be waiting on the delay for the feed. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. 
Try. You're cutting in and out quite a bit on our end as well. Okay. H hang with um, me for just a moment. I want to try something. Talk to us. Um, test, test, one, two, test. Can you hear me? Hello? Okay, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So you can relay it, Brandon. Okay. Important for them. They don't feel that it's all that worthwhile. I think the bandages might be, but not the yeah, right. right. I, I was thinking it would be interesting if you had like a a big television screen up somewhere and just showed pictures of a wound at certain times. Not not in any really major way. No more decorations. I think so. It would be like watching an episode of House where they cast <laughs> <to> the <laughs> There would be a certain power in seeing nastiness. I mean, yeah. 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 I'm not saying it's going to be yeah. fun yeah. for the whole family. <laughs> <laughs> about needing how there were too many kings and we couldn't share the island like that's that's very topical right now in the UK um, Scotland has set a date to actually vote on whether or not they want to stay part of the UK and the view that was being advocated of needing a unification 
might not be the best view to advocate right now <laughs> in the UK. Um, so I don't know, it's just it's jarring with some things that I've seen primarily at heritage sites in the UK, in Scotland especially. Uh, you go through there like on the train and you see all kinds of crosses of St. Andrews flying. You hit England and it's all Union Jacks or uh, St. George. And it's very clear that there's still that very, very strong distinction. And instead of like working to get more together, they are currently breaking more apart. So it would be very interesting to see how that might go over in an English or Scottish setting. And Wales too has started uh, implementing mandatory learning Welsh in schools. They're sort of fermenting a little bit of a Welsh independence movement, so things are kind of falling apart. Just, yeah, it's a little, it was a very topical statement given where it, where at that point they are actually making Wales part of England and to the point that Wales gets forgotten a lot um, and now coming forward, what, 600 years, we're at a point where all those nations that they will be unified go apart. So I, it was just an interesting moment that could maybe be worked into a much more topical reference. So. Very good. Yeah, that's all. Very good. All right, so uh, one, one final question before we uh, uh, wrap this up for tonight. Um, would, would you be interested in seeing display for, for real on stage at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yes. All right, I got a lot of head nods on that one, so that's a good sign. Make sure to pass that along to Stephen. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Before we wrap for the night, let's, uh, let's give it up for our two wonderful actors, uh, Zandra <laughs> and Neil Hollins, and our narrator, Mr. Michael Westerberg. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming and enjoy your evening. And if you'd like to watch it again later, it will be posted on uh, uh, HowlRound and New, New Play TV. Thank you very much for joining us. Sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and um, the, uh, it, we kept the recording going as well, so I do have a recording of it. So if you'd like that, I can also get that to him. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and we're we're we're, we're glad uh, we're, we're very happy to do this. So, uh, but very well. Okay, great. All right, thank you so much. Bye.
Like, no. that's what <laughs> I got me on 608. Life is not working. Yeah, I know. We know.